Hello and welcome to the Emmanuel Croydon podcast. At Emmanuel Croydon, we exist to be a community drawn together by our desire to know and follow Jesus. We long to become disciples of Jesus who are equipped to serve him in the whole of life, transforming families, communities and workplaces as we love God with heart, mind, soul and strength. We hope you enjoy this week's talk from the morning services. Thank you for joining us today. Grace and peace to you. Hello and welcome to the last of our series of podcast sermons on St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. I'm reading today from chapter 12 verses 1 to 10. You may like to follow this if you have a Bible handy. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. If you've been following the whole of this sermon series, you will be aware that Paul wrote at least four letters to the church that he planted in Corinth. In what we call 1 Corinthians, Paul refers to a previous letter. So 1 Corinthians was actually the second letter to the Corinthians. In what we call 2 Corinthians, Paul again refers to an earlier letter. He says in chapter 2 that it was written out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve them, but to let them know the depth of his love for them. 1 Corinthians doesn't fit that description. So we can conclude that there was a third letter in between the two. We call it the severe letter. So 2 Corinthians should perhaps be called 4 Corinthians. But when we look closely at 2 Corinthians, we see an abrupt change of tone between chapters 9 and 10. In chapters 1 to 9, we have a letter of reconciliation and practical instruction, some of which we've been looking at in recent weeks. In chapters 10 to 13, Paul is defending his ministry against scathing attacks from people he refers to as those super apostles teachers who have led the Corinthians astray and undermined Paul's ministry among them. He describes them as false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. That comes in chapter 11, verse 13. In response to what they have done, Paul resorts to boasting about his own ministry. In fact, the word boast and its derivatives occur 16 times in chapters 10, 11, and 12. These chapters fit perfectly the description of the severe letter. 
I wrote to you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. So most scholars conclude that what we have in chapters 10 to 13 is that third letter or part of it misplaced years later when Paul's letters were collated. It is the most biographical of all Paul's letters, a bold and in places sarcastic defense of his ministry. Let me read a few verses from chapter 11 to show how strongly Paul feels about what is going on in Corinth. What anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin, and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. We can feel the, the raw emotion that Paul is expressing. And in our reading today, he continues to pour out those feelings. I must go on boasting, he writes in verse 1. And as he does so, he uses two rhetorical tools. He says that he says what he could boast about while half pretending that he isn't. And he refers to himself in the third person, describing his own spiritual experience of visions and revelations as though they happened to someone else. He describes a spiritual experience so great that he doesn't know whether, it, whether or not it was in the body or apart from the body. Using the ancient world understanding of the layers of heaven, he says he was caught up to the third heaven not just the first or second, but the third heaven, and caught up to paradise. And that in that experience, he heard inexpressible things, things that as a human being, he is not permitted to tell. He wants his readers to know that he could boast about such a surpassingly great experience and revelation. Having told them, about that amazing experience, perhaps the high point of his life, Paul couples it with one of his most painful experiences, which perhaps was the low point of his life. He describes this experience metaphorically as a thorn in his flesh. It was not a literal thorn that he got while pruning the roses or picking blackberries. Commentators speculate about what it was. Some suggest that Paul suffered from epilepsy or migraines or recurrent fevers, though there's no evidence to suggest that he suffered from any of these conditions. Some suggest that it may have been Paul's poor eyesight. Now that we do know about from his letter to the Galatians. When he first visited Galatia, he was very ill. The people there cared for him. And in Galatians 4 verse 15, he commends them by writing, I can testify 
that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. So the illness he suffered there seems to have affected his eyes. At the end of that letter, a letter that he had dictated, he added a sentence in his own hand and commented on the large letters he used, again an indication of his poor sight. All we know for sure is that the thorn in his flesh was an affliction or disability of some sort that affected him physically and that he prayed three times to the Lord to take it away. That didn't happen. I don't know about you, but I find it reassuring to know that even Paul experienced what we call unanswered prayer in the sense of prayer that was not answered in the way he hoped. So, of course, did Jesus himself in the olive grove of Gethsemane. In reality, neither prayer was unanswered. For true Christian prayer is not about trying to persuade God to do our will. Rather, our prayers should be about accepting God's will for us and aligning ourselves with it. The answer Paul received was in the form of reassurance and the strength to endure. God said to him, My grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Or as the New Living Translation puts it, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Paul was so convinced by this answer that he was able to embrace the affliction, whatever it was, to accept it and to be thankful for it as something that prevented him from becoming conceited about his amazing spiritual experiences. God chose not to relieve him of this suffering for a reason. And therefore, after all the boasting of chapters 10 and 11, Paul is able to say in chapter 12, verse 9, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me, so that the power of Christ can work through me, as the New Living Translation puts it. Because he accepted God's answer, Paul is able to delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties. For, as he says at the conclusion of our reading, when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul knows that he is utterly dependent on God's power. What did Paul mean by his weakness? He was by any reckoning a strong man. The New Testament reveals him to be a man with great abilities, a good education and high social standing. Judging by the distances he travelled on foot and by ship, he was not lacking in stamina and physical resilience. Yet he was happy to be considered weak, if that would further the gospel and bring glory and honour to Christ. Being aware of his own limitations, such as they were, and in touch with his own vulnerability, served constantly to remind him of his utter dependence on God. When I am weak, then I am strong. Is this then a general principle that is true for all Christians? Well, Peter is a good example. He was an experienced fisherman, yet he learned in humility to accept instructions from a carpenter about when and where to put down his nets. When he attempted to walk on the water of Lake Galilee towards Jesus, he learned that he could do the seemingly impossible as long as he depended on the Lord, but not in his own ability. And we have, of course, the supreme example in Jesus himself who won salvation for all humankind, not by an act of great strength and power, 
but in his moment of greatest weakness and vulnerability on the cross. So it's reasonable to conclude that this principle applies to us too. When we are weak, then we are strong. But how? What weaknesses may we recognize as opportunities for God to make us strong and use us beyond our imagining? Well, I think first we should be clear about two things that Paul is not saying here. First, he is not writing about moral or spiritual weakness. We know that we are all sinners, but this is not an invitation to excuse our failure to live up to God's standards. And secondly, he is not inviting us to embrace incompetence as if it were a good thing. When we advertised for a new vicar, we didn't deliberately look for a mediocre preacher rather than a good preacher or a person with poor leadership skills in order to give an opportunity for God's power to be seen more clearly. At least, I assume that we didn't. In ministry, God uses the skills and abilities that he has blessed his people with, and we should not despise them or disparage them. So what was Paul writing about? When he wrote, when I am weak, then I am strong, he was referring to a condition or circumstance that had the potential to obstruct his ministry, but that God's power enabled him to overcome. What excited Paul ab about his thorn in the flesh was that it prevented him from becoming conceited by the revelations and experiences that he had received. The sin of pride or conceit could so easily have undermined his ministry. He came to relish anything that would cause people to observe his ministry and to recognize that it was not all his own work. Seeing his vulnerability enabled people to recognize that God was at work in him and through him. So the principle seems to me to be this. God is glorified more by what he enables us to achieve despite our weaknesses, than by what we achieve through our natural strengths. So what should our prayer be? Maybe something like this. Lord, make me aware of my weaknesses and vulnerability and help me despite them or even because of them to bring glory to your name. The obvious way to end this sermon is for me to give a personal ex example, an illustration of my own weakness and how God has used it or overcome it in a way that brings glory to Jesus. That is easier said than done. It's easy enough to identify weaknesses, less easy to identify where God has used or overcome them in a way that glorifies him. I decided to take a risk and ask my wife to help me. She's usually good at recognizing my weaknesses. She also sees as weaknesses some things that I always thought were strengths. So the first thing she mentioned was perfectionism and we re revisited the old argument about whether that is a weakness or a strength. But whichever it is, we both struggled to think of an example of how the Lord's power had been seen at work in that particular weakness. Some of the speculation written about Paul's thorn in the flesh prompted me, though, to reflect on one particular aspect of my experience. I do not have natural pastoral gifts. Several times as a teenager and as a student, I considered whether God was calling me to ordination. My mother always laughed at the idea and dismissed it with statements like, heaven help any church that has you as its minister. Then when I was 29 and 
during my career as a young barrister, I suddenly had an epileptic fit. I knew nothing about it until I woke up in Mayday Hospital. I had gone back to work after a few days off with a virus. The last thing I remember was being at the bus stop near our home. They told me in the hospital that I had got onto a bus, then had a very violent fit and was left unconscious on the back seat until an ambulance arrived. Everyone else had to get off the bus and wait for the next bus. If I hadn't been unconscious, I would have been so embarrassed. I had another similar but less embarrassing episode four years later. The diagnosis of the neurologist that I saw was that the fits were the way that my brain reacted to a combination of stress and a virus. For many years I took medication to prevent this happening and I recognise that I am very fortunate that this did not affect me when I was a child and that it was so easily controlled. Reflecting now on that experience, I realise that it probably gave me greater insight into the experience of people who suffer ill health and greater pastoral understanding. It also made me careful not to work excessively hard and so may have played a part in preventing me from becoming so busy that I had no time to play my part in the life of the church. Unlike Paul, I can't boast of a clear revelation to match his. I didn't hear God say, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. But I do believe that that is what God says to each of us, whatever our particular weaknesses may be. God's grace is sufficient for us in every circumstance we face. One person who has a much more powerful testimony to give about this is Ben, our associate vicar. I'm sure I'm not the only member of this church who is in awe of the way he accepted gradually becoming blind and amazed at the remarkable way in which God is able to use him despite or perhaps because of his blindness. By a strange coincidence, Ben was speaking on this very passage last week at the 10 o'clock stream service in the series of talks on prayer. We didn't arrange this deliberately, but perhaps God's hand was in it. He gave a moving personal testimony about the effect his blindness has had on him and on his ministry. And I can think of no better way to end this sermon than by urging you to listen to it, if you've not done so already. It's on the Emmanuel website and YouTube channel. And to listen again, even if you did hear it last week. You can get it by going to the Emmanuel website, emmanuelcroydon.org.uk, and clicking on the link to our live stream services and selecting the service for the 23rd of August. And if you don't want to watch the whole service, Ben's talk begins 36 and a half minutes in. It is a powerful and honest testimony from a man for whom I have the utmost respect and admiration. And it bears out what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. May we all discover that God's grace is sufficient for us and that God's power is seen all the more clearly through our weakness. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Emmanuel Croydon podcast. For more information about our church and everything we have going on, visit our website, emmanuelcroydon.org.uk. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram to see and hear what's going on in the life of our church. God bless you and have a wonderful week.